Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Stay Awake. When I say stay awake, I don't mean physically. I mean spiritually. You know, there's several times in scripture when Jesus implores his disciples to stay awake. And if it was so important for Jesus' disciples to stay awake back then, how much more important do you think it is for us Christians who live so close to his return to stay awake? But it's not just enough to stay awake. We need to stay awake and watch. We need to keep watch. Keep watch with all diligence over our hearts. Why? Because we live in a fallen and depraved world that gets more and more wicked and more and more depraved each and every day. And we do not want to be swept up in their tide. Plus, we do not know the day when Jesus will break that eastern sky to come back to get us, his people, his children. And we need to be ready for that day. Therefore, stay awake. Please turn with me to our scripture reading, which is found in Mark chapter 13, verse 32 through 37. But of that day or that hour knoweth no one, not even the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. It is as when a man, sojourning in another country, having left his house and given authority to his servants, to each one his work, commanded also the porter to watch. Watch therefore, for ye know not when the Lord of the house cometh, whether at even or at midnight, or at cock growing, or in the morning, least come and suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Someone might say, ah, oh, Brother Kenny, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Yes, that is true. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. But please notice how Jesus closes his discourse in verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. These words were indeed spoken to his disciples, but rest assured that it included us as well. Us, but not just us, but all Christians. We're to stay awake and watch. This word, watch, it means to be alert. It means to keep zealous watch over. But what does it mean to keep a zealous watch over? It means to guard your soul in such a way that it fosters a desire to know Jesus Christ personally and to have a real relationship with him and to have a strong desire for the things of God. The 18th century pastor and theologian, Jonathan Edwards, who was responsible for the Great Awakening in the 1700s, as a young man, wrote a list of 70 resolutions that he lived his life by. And I want to read just a few of them for you. Number seven, and I quote, resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life, end of quote. We could all benefit from adhering to that. If we lived our life with the fear of Almighty God, we would not get involved in the things that we get involved in, murmuring and bickering and complaining and squabbling, whining and being ungrateful, fits of anger and road rage if it was the last hour of our life. It is no way that we would spend our time doing all of those things or getting caught up in those things. What we would spend our life or our, our last hour in is love, loving our family, loving Jesus, loving our, preparing to make sure that our lives lined up 
with what Jesus is looking for when he comes back. These traits I listed above are a distraction. They're a menace to the Christian life. Number eight, resolved to act in all respects, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I, and as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others, and that I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in me, and prove only an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God. Instead of having a holier-than-thou attitude and living like we're the only ones that have never sinned, we would empathize and try to correct and encourage others. Far too often, we see the speck in our brother's eye and we ignore the log in our own eye. The English reformer and martyr, John Bradford, who was in prison in the Tower of London for alleged crimes against Queen Mary I, said, and I quote, there but for the grace of God goes John Bradford. End of quote. He was later burned at the stake on July the 1st, 1555. Although a pious man himself, Bradford did not look down on others who struggled with vices, but rather he pitied them, knowing fully well that it's by grace and grace alone that we are saved. Number 12. Resolved, if I take delight in it, as a gratification of pride or vanity or on any such account immediately to throw it by." End of quote. Jonathan Edwards was prone to the same vices that we're prone to. Pride would build up in him, but he made sure that he did not let it overwhelm his life, did not let it take control of his life. And it would do us well to steer clear of those things as well. Those things that stroke our ego and cause our pride to grow and to flourish. Remember the proverb, pride goes before destruction. Number 14, resolve never to do anything out of revenge. To take revenge is to usurp the right and the prerogative of Almighty God. For God said, vengeance is mine. Number 15, resolve never to suffer the least motions of anger towards irrational beings, end of quote. That, my friends, is easier said than done. But anger is a real threat in the church. Retaliation is a real thing in the church of Jesus Christ. Being offended is a real thing. Quick-temperedness is a real struggle. We must resolve these things if we want to live the kind of life that Jesus is coming back for. Number 16, resolve never to speak evil of anyone so that it shall tend to his dishonor, more or less upon no account except for some real good. In other words, Jonathan Edwards resolved not to be involved in backbiting. He, he resolved not to be involved in tail bearing. He resolved not to be a part of that little clique that talks about each other and makes divisions in the church. Oh, if today's church would only grab a hold of that, we would not have so many church splits. Number 17. Resolve that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. This is huge. In other words, live your life with as little regret as possible. Do the things that actually count. Carpe diem. Seize the day. In other words, make every day count to get the most, get the fullest out of it. Do not let a day go by without achieving something and that something to Jesus Christ for his glory. Number 19, resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do 
if I expect it, it would not be above an hour before I should hear the last trump. Again, staying awake. Living our lives like we're expecting Jesus to return at any moment. Watching and praying so that we might not fall into temptation. The New Testament believers lived their lives that way. They lived their lives with the expectancy of Jesus' return in their lifetime. And they turned the whole world upside down with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would do us well to live our lives the same way. The last one, number 20. Resolve to maintain the strictest temperance in eating and drinking. This is something that most Christians do not even think about, much less practice as a discipline. Jonathan Edwards was not necessarily talking about fasting, and fasting only, but about everyday eating and drinking. But when it comes to fasting, it's the hardest thing to get a Christian today to fast. They are just not interested and fast it. But concerning everyday eating, Christians will consume foods that are known to be harmful to their health, but because it tastes good. Jonathan Edwards had 70 of these resolutions that he lived his life by. From time to time, he would read it. He would not let them go out of his mind. From the time he was a young man, he adhered to these 70 resolutions that he wrote down on paper. And it would benefit each one of us if we were to write down a few resolutions of our own to enhance our own lives and not abandon those resolutions halfway through January. Oh, but Brother Kenny, these are different days that we live in. We have to deal with so many distractions and infiltrations of our mind and all the different winds of change that blew us off course. It's not that easy. I know. I live right there too. But we have no choice. Jesus is coming back real, real soon. So what is the solution? Well, the encouragement that the Philippian church received from St. Paul was to practice this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. If you think about that, that statement that, that um, Paul just made to the Philippian church, they are practical steps that Paul is lining out for them to follow in order to keep Jesus relevant and foremost in their lives. First, Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, we are to think on these things. Think about them in the day. We think about them at night. We think about them when we go to sleep. We think about them when we wake up. We meditate on these things. And you know what? That would eliminate 95% of the foolishness that we watch on social media that is portrayed as truth, but portrayed as honorable. Society has become so disgustingly revolting, talking about men can get pregnant, and that there's 3,289 different genders, and that we are to forget the science and just take their word for it. They inundate are gullible young people with these lies and even our older people, our older level-headed folks are swallowing that bait, hook, line, and sinker. I came across this quote on the internet, apparently quoted from a book written in 1869 entitled The Crown of Life. I want to quote it for you. 
If a lie is only printed often enough, it becomes a quasi-truth. And if such a truth is repeated often enough, it becomes an article of belief, a dogma. A man will die for it, end of quote. And man, have they descended on that? A quasi-truth means incomplete information in historical sciences. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it this way. Having some resemblance, usually by possession of certain attributes, having a legal status only by operation or construction of law and without reference to intent. In other words, it is truth because they say it is truth without any scientific or practical data as proof to back it up. Then, when this truth, this quasi-truth, is repeated often enough, it becomes an article of belief, or it becomes a dogma. When it becomes a dogma, people so marry into this dogma that it becomes intertwined in their lives, and men and women, young and old, will die to defend it. When in reality, that quasi-truth is a full-blown lie. Just go on any social media you choose today and you will find young people passionately defending their quasi-truth with everything that is within them. It works. It is so well, it works so well that society has employed it to, to the fullest. Now, I want you to listen to how famous leaders, famous world leaders, have gravitated to this concept and made it their own. Adolf Hitler, 1889 to 1945, Fuhrer of Germany, the Nazi party, quote, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed, end of quote. Joseph Goebbels, 1897 to 1945, Chancellor of Germany, Nazi party, quote, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. End of quote. Vladimir Lenin, 1870 to 1924, chairman of the Council of the People's Commissar of Soviet Union. Quote, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. End of quote. Now, do you understand why Jesus commanded us, why he said it was so imperative that his followers stay diligent. Stay awake, keep watch, should be the national cry of today's church. But instead, today's church has been lulled to sleep by sweet, savory words tickling their ears. They have been pacified by smooth-talking politicians and their indirect brides. Today's church has fallen asleep on their watch. They're like sleeping dogs that don't bark. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 through 51. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Blessed! is the servant whom Jesus finds doing what he has commanded him to do. That servant will be rewarded. But woe, woe be on the servant that is found asleep and is not doing what the master has commanded him to do. That servant will find himself or herself appointed to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. I realize that it's not popular these days to preach the concept of eternal judgment, but it is a real, real truth 
nonetheless. I realize also that truth is a concept that man has been struggling with since forever. At least from the time of Pontius Pilate who said, ah, truth. What is truth? Well, truth is there's an appointed time that is coming when the whole world will be judged. The living as well as those who have died. From the time of Cain and Abel until the day we hear the sound of the last trump, the last trumpet being blown. The truth is, Jesus will sit on his glorious throne and he will judge every living creature. The truth is, those who hear, well done my good and faithful servant, will enter into the joy of their Lord. They will enter eternity to be with Jesus forever and ever. There will be no more tears. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more hunger. There'll be no more fear. There'll be no more need, no more want. For all things have passed away, and behold, all things have been made new. But the truth is, it won't be so for the sleeper. It won't be so for the unbeliever. I want to quote Jesus himself, and he said in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The truth is, there is a place of utter darkness, a place, a lake, Jesus said, that burns with fire, brimstone. It burns with sulfur that will never, ever be quenched. That fire will burn throughout all eternity. A place so terrible that if you knew your worst enemy, who you can't even think one good thought towards, was going there, you would warn him, you would warn her with all diligence. You would say, don't go there. It is an awful place, a dreadful place, a horrible, unbearable, terrible place to go. It's flames and it's torment, it's anguish and it's suffering will never ever end. It has no end. Don't go there. That is truth. Why would you risk that eternal truth for a moment of pleasure, sex, money, power, fame? Why? These things are passing away. Even now, the net that is set around us is closing in on us. You don't believe me? Just take a listen to the World Economic Forum's plans that they have for you, that they have for me, that they have for our family. You think you have freedom now to do whatever you like. You can run up and down the streets as you wish. You have the freedom just to walk into the stores and take whatever you feel like without paying for it. You have the freedom to burn buildings down and destroy businesses. You have the freedom to murder the farmers. You don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what you're unleashing. You're playing right into their hands, giving them the one reason that they're looking for, to spring the trap and bring the hammer down, not just upon you, not just upon your family, but upon the whole world. Then who will you blame? Think about that. Don't let quasi-truth blind your good judgment. The facts do not lie. Yesterday's conspiracies are today's truths. For those who don't see it, for those who can't see it, they are either blind or refuse to see. Like Paul told the Thessalonians about those who are perishing, he said, they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. It is not that they did not have the opportunity. It did not it is not that they did not understand, but they refused the truth. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. They straight up refused. I'm not doing it. 
I'm not believing it. I want my way. Why would it be held back in somebody else's way? Don't believe the quasi-truth that it does not matter to Jesus how you live. There's a right way to live. There's a wrong way to live. And you need to find that right way. You need to find the way that is written in Scripture that says, Walk ye in this way and walk ye in it. So let me ask you, are you walking in truth today? There are only two destinations after the judgment, either an in eternal blissfulness with Jesus or an eternal sorrow and torment without Jesus. If you deny him now, he will deny you then. If you refuse him now, he will refuse you then. Now is your opportunity. Today is the day of repentance. Tomorrow is promised to no man. Now is the time. Seek the Lord while he can be found. So let me ask you, would you like to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? Would you like to escape that lake of fire that burns forever and ever? The torment, the punishment never ends. The screams. They never die. If you would like to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and escape all of that and be with him in blissfulness for all eternity, here's how. Ask him. How do I ask him, Brother Kenny? Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to know truth. Help me to realize lies when they're told to me. Lord Jesus, I don't want to just escape a lake of fire. I want to live my life devoted to you, loving you, honoring you, living my life in truth, not in lies. Thank you, Jesus, for coming Thank you for your truth that there is life in your name. I accept that truth now. I accept your free gift of salvation. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your, all your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And make no mistake, Jesus is coming back one day to get us. And we will spend eternity in one place or the other place. So what I want you to do is to be prepared. How do I prepare, be prepared, Brother Kenny? Buy a Bible. Read the scriptures. Don't believe what you hear on social media. Don't believe what you read on the internet, that it doesn't matter to Jesus. It matters to Jesus. He gave his life for you. It matters. So make sure you know what matters to him. Because he's coming back and he's going to be judging. What's he judging on? What he's told us. How do you know? Read your Bible. Study the scriptures. Highlight those scriptures. Hide his word away in your heart that you might not sin against him. After, after that, now what I want you to do is to find a Bible-believing church. Not a progressive church. A Bible-believing church who still believes in holiness, who believes in righteousness, who preaches out of the Bible, who believes in, an, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus has not somehow become impotent, but that his power is still great. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing, and he'll say, well done my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you dearly. He died for you. And we love you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.